Homage to Shakyamuni Buddha, our great teacher. Homage to Mandrushri, the warrior of wisdom. Homage to all the lineage gurus who have helped us immensely. Even after countless kalpas, it is rare to encounter the supreme, profound and wonderful Dharma. Now that we have the opportunity to read, hear and practice it, may we understand the true meaning of the Tathagata. To liberate all sentient beings, let us generate bodhicitta. The background of the text. Petrol and Poche shared a story about this text in his famous book, The Words of My Perfect Teacher. Chikawa, a very wise Geshe from the Kadampa lineage, had been learning from multiple spiritual teachers since childhood. He was proficient in the five great treatises and knowledgeable about both the new and the old traditions. Once he went to visit Geshe Changshingwa. He saw a small text by the pillow and opened it. When he came across the sentence, I shall take loss and defeat upon myself and give gain and victory to others, he was instantly filled with strong faith and thought it was precious and rare. Then he asked Chak Shingwa, What is the name of this teaching? Where can I learn it? Chak Shingwa told him, this is the second half of the fifth verse from the eight verses for training the mind, composed by Langri Tangpa. He is still alive and actively propagating the Dharma. He is the lineage holder of this teaching. Thus, Chikawa immediately embarked on a long journey to Lhasa to search for Langri Tangpa. After enduring countless hardships along the way, he finally arrived at Lhasa. In the past, people would travel thousands of miles and endure countless hardships in their quest for the Dharma. It was not easy to receive the Dharma at that time. Upon reading just half a verse, he decided to seek the teaching. Nowadays, if someone reads these eight verses after seeing them, it is already considered remarkable. He tried to search for Langri Tangpa while circumambulating stupas. One evening, he met a leper from Langtang and inquired about the news of Langri Tangpa. The leper told him that Langri Tangpa had just passed away. Chikawa felt sad and asked who the successor of the lineage was. The leper told him, Geshe Shangshongpa and Geshe Dodipa are the two main disciples of Langri Tangpa, but they argue about who should be the lineage holder every day. Chikawa felt very disappointed. He believed that if the two main disciples really held the lineage of the eight verses for training the mind, they would not argue over the position of the lineage holder. As a result, he gave up his plan to visit Langtang Monastery. However, in reality, the two geishas were not competing for the position of lineage holder, but endorsing each other. Shang Shanpa told Dadipa, You are older. You shall be the lineage holder. I will serve you just as I served Langri Tangpa. But Dadipa replied, You are younger with profound wisdom and pure discipline. You shall be the successor. The two great masters engaged in a disagreement out of humility. 
unaware of the situation, the leper unintentionally caused Chikawa to misunderstand them. Later, Chikawa heard that Gishi Shirawa was the genuine holder of the teaching, so he went to learn from him. At that time, Shirawa was very renowned and gave Dharma teachings to numerous disciples every day. However, after studying with Shirawa for a while, Chikawa did not hear a word about the teaching he sought. Feeling dissatisfied, Chikawa began to doubt whether the teacher had the lineage of this teaching. Once, when Geisha Shirawa was circumambulating a stupa, Chikawa spread his cloth on the road and invited Shirawa to sit. Shirawa replied, I'm not used to sitting outside. I will return after completing my circumambulation. If you have something to ask, please go ahead. Chikawa asked, I read these words, I shall take loss and defeat upon myself and give gain and victory to others. Is this a profound teaching or not? Sharawa replied, This teaching can be both profound and not profound. If you aspire to attain Buddhahood in this very life, this teaching is profound. However, if you don't have such aspirations, this teaching may not be considered important or extraordinary. Do you hold this teaching? Chikawa asked. Yes, it is my main practice, Shurawa replied. Could you teach it to me? Chikawa asked. If you can stay with me for a long time, perhaps I will teach it to you, Shurawa responded. Hence, Chikawa stayed with Sharawa for six years and finally received the complete transmission of the eight verses for training the mind. Through dedicated practice, he eventually eradicated all attachment to I and mine. What do you think after hearing this story? In the past, it was not easy to seek the Dharma, and teachers wouldn't impart teachings to students lightly. In fact, there are benefits to raising the bar for receiving the Dharma. If a teaching is obtained with great difficulty, you will practice it. If it is easily obtained, some people may not practice it and think that what comes easily is not valuable. If it takes a lot of time and effort, especially if you have to spend lots of money, such as gold and silver, to obtain a teaching, you will practice it earnestly. However, if a teacher gives a Dharma teaching to you for free, you may think it is nothing and not cherish it. Today, we shared this story to remind you to cherish the Dharma. Although I don't charge you, you should value this teaching. It is very profound. This is how people in the past sought the Dharma. Staying with the teacher for six years means serving him for six years, and only then would the teacher gradually transmit the teaching to him. Why did the teacher do this? It was to observe whether the student had faith Even if the teacher transmits a teaching to you, if you lack faith, you won't make progress through practicing it. The teacher is not stingy with the teachings. Many people don't understand and think, is it necessary to set such a high threshold for receiving the Dharma? Well, this is not the case. The teacher's main purpose is to observe whether the student is qualified. Even if the teacher transmits a teaching to you, if you are not a qualified disciple, you won't succeed in practicing it. This message is crucial. If you are not a qualified disciple, you won't successfully practice the teachings you receive. 
you will encounter obstacles and find it difficult to continue. Even if you receive a teaching, you may feel that it came too easily and cannot accomplish it. Therefore, first and foremost, you need to possess the qualities of a disciple and accumulate sufficient merits. Only then can you make progress through your practice. This is my profound experience. It is not because the teacher is stingy, like those who withhold martial arts skills for their own benefit. Those who have generated bodhicitta won't act in such a way. They are eager for others to progress faster and better than themselves. The author of the text Geshe Langri Tangpa from the Kadampa lineage was one of the two main disciples of Geshe Patoa, who was one of the six senior disciples of Lama Atisha. Lama Atisha had six highly accomplished disciples. Langri Tangpa was one of the two main disciples of Geshe Patoa, who was one of the six senior disciples of Lama Atisha. Therefore, Langri Tangpa was Lama Atisha's grand disciple. Langri Tangpa once made an aspiration. May I benefit sentient beings in the appearance of a monk in all my lifetimes. Then, Polden Lamu, glorious goddess, a Dharma protector, also made an aspiration. As Langri Tangpa made such a vow, I also promised to protect and support him to accomplish all his activities. Because of this, the lineage disciples of Langri Tangpa all have Paldan Lamu as their Dharma protector. Geshe Langri Tangpa upheld pure ethical discipline throughout his entire life. After practicing in a secluded place for a long time, he began to accept disciples and imparted Dharma teachings to them. It is said that he had a retinue of over 2,000 disciples. In the past, the Buddha also had several thousand disciples who regularly stayed with him. We refer to such practitioners, just like us, as resident practitioners. He built the Langtang Monastery at the place called Langtang, so people named him Langri Tangpa. He never smiled in his life except on one occasion when a mouse tried to move a piece of turquoise on his mandala plate. The mouse was trying desperately to push the turquoise but could not move it, so it called over another mouse to come and help. Together, they managed to move the turquoise stone away. This scene made Langri Tangpa smile, which was the only time that he smiled in his entire life. He always had a gloomy expression, so people called him Lang Tangpa Gloomy Face. One of his disciples advised him not to be so gloomy. He replied, when I think about the suffering in samsara and the absence of happiness in the three realms, how could I ever possibly smile? Petrol Rinpoche once said, When you meditate on the suffering of samsara, you should meditate it at all times, like Langri Tangpa, and thus arouse a genuine renunciation of samsara from the bottom of your heart. Let's use a metaphor to illustrate it. Will a person who falls into a dung pit feel happy? If they haven't climbed out of the pit, they won't smile. If you eat and live in a cesspool, I don't think you will be happy. The detailed biography of Geshe Langri Tangpa can be found in the Blue Annals. Langri Tangpa was Lama Atisha's grand disciple and lived from 1054 to 1123 CE. 
It was during China's Song Dynasty when Buddhism was flourishing with many great masters. However, at that time, Buddhism was still underdeveloped in the Tibetan region and not as prosperous as in the Han region. Lama Atisha had just begun to propagate the Buddha's teachings in Tibet. The title of the text The eight verses for training the mind is not a complete commentary. According to the defined structure of Buddhist scriptures originated in India, a special feature of a Tripitaka text is to have a homage verse at the beginning and a dedication verse at the end. This feature can be used to differentiate the Buddhist scriptures from non-Buddhist ones. Based on the homage verse, we can also tell if the text belongs to the Sutra Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka or Abhidharma Pitaka, the tradition and deity of the author, etc. However, this text has neither a homage verse at the beginning nor a dedication verse at the end. Therefore, we can infer that it might be a pith instruction on mind training of Langri Tangpa. Mind training means observing and cultivating one's mind. Petrol and Poche said, Mind training is about cultivating one's own mind. If you cultivate your mind with the four thoughts of renunciation, even if you haven't done virtuous deeds with your body and speech, apart from liberation, you will not reach anywhere else. Therefore, mind training is the most important practice in Buddhism. The eight verses in this text are eight key instructions of Mahayana practice. In other words, the Buddhasattva vows, as well as their cultivation tips, are encompassed in these eight verses. This text was composed based on the Buddha Chitta Pith instructions of Lama Atisha and Geshe Potua. These eight verses look independent but are in a specific order, forming a complete mind training system. They may appear as eight separate verses but are actually step by step. Now, let's begin to study this text.